at um, Psalm 144. So I guess you can open your Bible there. Psalm 144. So I want, to, I want to start off tonight as we get where we're going here, and I want to bring up something. I, I just want to remind you again of something, and you guys, no doubt, many of you have seen this, and sometimes you, sometimes you see it, but you don't know what you're seeing. Um, and that is one of the reasons people, Christians, wind up in the messes that they do is because they have arrived at a, um, a false conclusion, okay? So, you know, as you go along in your Christian life, and especially when you have major experiences, um, I, I suppose the same thing could be even true on, on the positive end of the spectrum, but it seems to be more rampant on the negative end of the spectrum where people have a, a negative experience of some sort, and I'm talking Christians now, and they, uh, they or maybe they have two or three or four, or maybe they maybe they have one, and they see their friends have one, or whatever, and um, and they they draw a conclusion, and their conclusion doesn't match what the Bible says, but in their mind, you know, they think, but but this has to be true because look how this turned out. That will almost always be a false conclusion, if if there's if something contradicts what the Scripture says, but it seems logical. Okay, what the problem is, is maybe the problem isn't even in your logic, but the problem is what you're seeing. And you're, you're assuming some things about a situation, but you don't know all the facts. And when you don't know all the facts, you, you'll, you'll just, man, you're just, you're just in a rough spot um, as far as drawing a conclusion. The Bible is always right. I had a friend of mine. He said, you know, he said that, it's one of those guys he's read he reads his bible through like four or five times a year and he's done it for years man he, he loves the bible he knows it inside and out and he said every once in a while he said in my christian life he said something would happen that really upset me and he said the reason it upset me was because i really didn't think the lord should have done that to me he said because i'm not you know you know he, he says I, I love the bible i love the church i'm always trying to help people and he said, there's been a few times in my life where something really difficult came my way. And he said, I would have this conversation with the Lord. And he would say, Lord, I am not happy about this. You might as well be honest, right? Because Lord already knows. And he said, Lord, I am not happy with this. Lord, I really don't think that I got, I, Lord, this shouldn't have turned out like this. I don't know why you're allowing this in my life. But then he said this. He said, but Lord, I know who the dummy is in this equation. He said, it's me. He said, I know that you know something that I don't know. And that's why you have allowed this. And he said, that's got me through many a difficult situation. Because really, that is always true. Um, let, me give you a, let me give you a couple examples in our world. Um, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't think that this would be something that would happen in our churches. There, there are shades of this that pop up, but, but you know, what do we have in our world right now? You've got a, you've got a lot of single moms out there, and um, these single moms, uh, you know, they they grow up and they're they they raise these children, and um, some of them, uh, they just become absolute man haters, and um, and the reason they do is. Why, why is it? It's because they went through a horrible experience and we would not minimize what they went through, but they came to a conclusion. And they tell every young woman they meet after that. Now, and this does happen sometimes with Christian women. They'll, they'll discourage them from getting married. They'll say, oh, you know, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, you know, and, and they just, and they just, and then, then, you know, what's even worse is then they work to effeminize their sons. Because they hate manhood. Of course, the world's got a name for it now because, you know, the world's always coming up with a new word. and They've got names for everything, you know. And, 
and it's called toxic masculinity. Uh, real men, I, I know there's abuse of men, but see, our world doesn't make the distinction. You say they don't? No, they don't. Let me illustrate that with your children. Man, I'm going all over the map. I want to come back to the toxic masculinity and effeminizing your sons. You know, you know what happened if several years ago? You know what social workers were being trained? See, they don't make distinctions, right? Let me ask you a question. Are there people that abuse their children? Yes or no? Are there people that horribly abuse their children? Yes or no? Absolutely. Are there religious groups that horribly abuse their children? Yes or no? Absolutely. So you know what social workers have been trained for a number of years now? They watch for abused children. Do you know what they've been taught is one of the signs of an abused child? If they come in to a room in a doctor's office, come in, they sit quietly, they're obedient, they're taught that's a sign of abuse. Because how did those children get that way? Now you know what that is? That is the absolute height of stupidity. But they don't make a distinction. Okay? So you've got, you've got this woman. She, she had a horrible experience. She's got three or four kids. And she's got some sons. I know a guy. I know him well. And he said, when my mom and dad split up, he's, he's a Christian guy, loves the Lord, thank God, to this day. And uh, he, he was, he's about this tall when his mom and dad broke up. He said, my mom from that day on was on a mission. She wanted to make me as effeminate as she could. He said, she put me in figure skating. I, I'm just, I'm just going to throw this out there and I'm not going to qualify all my statements. Uh, no man has, you know, figure skating, fi period. From, from the modesty standpoint, the music standpoint, it's just not justifiable. But to stick a boy in there? And he said, my mom was on a mission. She put me in figure skating. She put me in all sorts of stuff. She discouraged every manly quality that I ever had. She desperately wanted to make me look like I was from the land of Sodom. She, he said, that was her goal. That was her goal. Blatantly, that was her goal. You know why? She hated men. Why did she hate men? Because she had bad experience. Let me ask you a question. How many Christians have had a bad experience in a church somewhere? So what do you do after that? You throw it all out? Well, you certainly can. And what happens when you die and then reality sets in at the judgment seat of Christ? Then you realize what a fool you were. Because you threw everything away because you jumped to a conclusion. You thought, oh, it's always like this. Well, 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 wait a minute. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who loved the church and purchased it with his own blood. The church is his body and his bride. So you had a bad experience in the church. Do you throw it all out? But some people do. You know why? Because they, they, they drew a false conclusion. They have a bad experience with a, with a dictator pastor. Are there dictator pastors? Absolutely. So from that day on, they will never attend a church that has a pastor. They'll join home groups. They'll, they'll join some religious group that has a plurality of elders and nobody really seems to be in charge. But they will never again. Why? They had a bad experience. Listen, if you're going to do that when you have a bad experience, you know, sooner or later, you're going to have to cut out a whole pile of stuff out of your life. That's not how we draw our conclusions. Our conclusions must be here and not jaded by our emotions. All right. All right. So for a couple minutes, I'm sort of going to be all over the map here okay so um, we're still on the, the family training thing and um, um, so I'm, I'm going to start just in passing uh, and I'm, I'm not going to be long tonight but if you're not careful you'll draw some wrong conclusions um, in the way you deal with your kids and so we've been working our way through that 
Um, you know what some parents do with their kids? Many of you uh, are going to have kids in the next 10 years. Many of you are. You're going to get married. Wow, what a difference 10 years makes. You know, one day, one day Johnny is is 14 and you blink an eye and he's 24 and you blink again and he's 34. And it's like, wow, how did that happen? And now he's got three or four kids and that day's coming. Should the Lord tarry, that day is coming. Some of you will be able to help your, your children as they have children. And, um, and here's, here's one of the things, you know, Johnny or, or Susie, you know, they, uh, they have something that's really um, not a good characteristic. And, and you, if you're not careful, there's a little excuse that you can embrace that will hurt Johnny and Susie and will hurt everybody around them for many years to come, if not for the rest of their life. And you'll say, oh, that's just Johnny's personality. Um, you know what? The Bible says this, and I don't have the reference. You can come to me after. We'll find it. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. I mean, that means it's wrapped in there. It's tangled in tight. So let's give you the whole verse. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Years ago, it was our lot. And, and you guys, I'm sure even as I say this, examples of other things will come to your mind. There was um, a church we were part of many years ago, and there was a girl in the church, and she was a nice girl. She, she, wasn't, she wasn't mean and hateful and all that stuff. She really wasn't. But you know what she was? She was super over-talkative. I mean, over the top. And uh, when I met her, she was 16 years old, 16, 17, right around in there. I mean, she could talk a leg off a chair. And um, I, I have never understood that. Now, I know if you feel passionately about something, you can get talking about it. And you guys always listen to me and I yak in the pulpit. But you know what? <laughs> but, but you know what? Sometimes I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not that way. And I, I enjoy conversation. But I don't have any trouble just sitting around being quiet either. I, I don't have any trouble with that. Um, but I used to. When I was six or seven years old, I would talk to anything that moved. And I would tell personal details about our family. And my dad jumped on that like, a, like an eagle jumping on a fish. He, he began to immediately come down on me to put a halt to that. My dad was very wise. And as I got older, I learned two things from him. Learned a bunch of things from him. Uh, probably a bunch of things he wished I'd learned. I never learned. But, um, but I learned a couple things. My daddy told me this. He said, listen to people when they talk. Now, I don't do this. Okay, guys. I'm, I'm, some people, I'm going to make some people really uncomfortable here. I don't, I don't do this. I don't manipulate people psychologically. I don't do that. Manipulation under any guise is manipulation. And I don't do that. And my dad didn't either. But my dad was illustrating something. He said, son, he said, if you listen to people, let them talk. Just ask them a couple questions. Keep them talking. He said, they will tell you everything you want to know. He said, because people love to talk about themselves. And he said, if you just keep them talking, and they'll tell you everything you want to know. That's very true. Not everybody, of course. But a lot of people, they'll reveal things that they shouldn't reveal. In the multitude of words, oh, it's Johnny's personality. Um, pray tell, does the Bible have anything to say about this? Oh my, does it ever. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. And um, that girl, man, she would just talk and talk and talk. And, and um, it's been many years since then. And she still does that. She still does that. Can I tell you that everybody that knew her 
found it very unattractive. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's not wrong to talk. It's not to have, and there's people that you can bury your heart to and just talk. And I, I'm not, I'm not against that, but, but you, you, you know what I'm talking about. There are people, and here's this little, the little girl. And you know what? Her mom and dad never squelched that. You say, should they have? Absolutely. They should have taught her to bring her tongue and her mouth under control. They should have taught her that, yes, you can talk, but you need to listen. And yes, you can talk, but you need to show an interest in somebody else. And, and, you, and to do that, you have to listen. But she wasn't taught that. You know why? Because they, they said, well, ever since she was this high, she's always been talking. You know, it's just her personality. Well, what if her personality was punching people? Would you stop that? You got to be careful. See, people say, well, you know, I don't want to squelch their personality. Um, you know what? Every person that every child that's ever disciplined, you know what they learn? They learn control. Any person that is unrestrained becomes a problem in many areas because they have no restraint. They have no ability to reign themselves. We were talking before church this evening. Somebody's name came up. We have a friend in a faraway place, and you probably have one just exactly like this. Two people in the same family. And um, one of them, let me put it this way, both of them were, were, were overweight, and one of them was very overweight. To the point that the doctor looked at, and, and we're not talking about old people here. We're talking, we're talking 25. And the doc looked at the one gal and said, if you don't stop this, whatever you're doing with your eating, you are going to die. The one sister said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. And she hauled off and did it, man. Uh, you, you know, all that, all that revolves around no matter which diet you're going to jump on. It's all self-denial. That's really, you're just trying to make it palatable in one way or another. The other, the other sister, she, she, she sort of dealt with it for a while. And then she threw caution to the wind. And, um, and you, you, we were discussing why is that? Okay. Why is that? Why is it that the doctor can look you in your eyeballs and tell you, if you don't do something about this, you're going to die, and then you ignore it. Why is it? It's because there is painful self-denial involved. Painful over a long haul. You must rein yourself in. And she was never made to do that. And you know what? Probably somebody along the line said, oh, you know what? You know what? Somebody will, somebody will fall in love with you someday and they'll just have to accept you as you are. You know what that is? That's a false conclusion. False. Oh, that's just their personality. Um, can I throw this out there to you? Um and, and all right, I'll just say it. Some of some of you, I, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody in this room that this fits. But you can't have a. And I got some people watching here tonight. Probably several of our church people and some people out in the distance. Um, don't let your kids be picky. We had a missionary's family in our house a number of years ago, and uh, you know they. You know, my wife is a great cook, just like many of you ladies are. We got a lot of good cooks in this place. And um, I don't have anybody in this anybody in this room that I that I go to the food table in my old church in Saskatchewan. We we had we, we had one lady that it was it was bad. Like when I say it was bad, that's an understatement. And um, one day she made chocolate cake and she threw some beans in there just just for good measure. Okay. 
And um, so it was that kind of thing. And you would watch people come up to the food table like New Year's Eve. We had a potluck often. And uh, you'd see people, they'd walk up to the food table, and especially the young guys. They'd be watching, and, and they're just scanning the table. And, and you knew, everybody knew what everybody was thinking. It's like, which pot did she bring? And they studiously avoided that pot if they could figure out which one it was. Um, we, we don't have anybody like that here. All our ladies are just wonderful cooks. And, and, and my wife is a great cook. And, and um, I gained 15 pounds the first two weeks we were married. <laughs> and um, so um, we had these missionary kids. And they're like four and six years old. I don't like that. Oh, I don't eat that. And, and what's really bad is when mom pipes in, usually dad's sitting there embarrassed. Mom, oh, oh you know, they, they, don't, they don't really care for that. It's like, I'm just telling you, man, you know what? That should never be. Never. And that's your job. And it's a little hard when, you know, here's where the problem is, is the example of mom, dad, you know, mom and dad, you know, sure, you've got your preferences. I've got mine. But when I go to somebody's house, you know, and they 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 made something, they put it out there, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I'm going to eat some and, and you know, and I'm going to and, you know, I mean, I, I've got a place where I like just about everything. There's a couple things I don't like. But you know what? Um You know, well, Johnny, Johnny doesn't like that. You know what? We would have food out and um, we would, they had to eat a little bit of everything. They didn't have to eat a gob if they didn't like sauerkraut. You know, we, we didn't make them eat, you know, a big bowl of it, but they had to eat a little bit. They had to eat a little bit. They had to eat. They weren't getting up from that table. We were going to have a serious confrontation. And they were going to wish they'd eaten it. And then they were still going to eat it. <laughs> you know, there's ways to solve this. There's ways to do it, man. And you got to make it happen. It's mom and dad, you got to turn in. And you know, when they're little and this stuff starts popping up, it's like, no, 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 no. We are not going to have this. And you know what? You know what they learned? They learned to be kind. They learned to be gracious. They learned it doesn't always have to be their way. And, you know, on and on it goes. Um, don't let it be picky. All right. I want to talk to the ladies for a few minutes. Okay. And um, I just want to say, so I, actually, I'm, I'm talking to everybody because there's some things that will go across the, the board here. But um, you know, before I do that, before I do that, go to Psalm one forty four. What are we trying to do with our kids? You say, well, well, pastor, you know, I, I just think, you know, I don't know that all that's really so necessary. I, I don't think I don't think it, it has to be so. Have, again, have, you know what Jesus would say to you? He would say, have you not read? That's what he'd say to you. Oh, my. If Jesus was standing here. He knows your thoughts. You say, oh, pastors over the top. Oh, you know what the Lord Jesus would say right at this moment? He'd look right at you and he'd say, have you not read? That's half our problem. We're starting a new year. It'd be a good year to start reading through your Bible. What does the scripture have to say? Look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144, verse 11. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. Now watch. Why does he pray? Lord, please do this. And he says, here's the purpose. Verse 12. 
that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. We want them to be the best that they can be. You know, you know, half our problem is, man, the, the standards have dropped so low. And you know what the average Christian parent and the average church is? Because nobody ever talks about this stuff. And the old school has just about died off. And so every, everybody's gotten used to all this mediocre nonsense. And they're just happy as long as, you know, Johnny's semi-normal and he doesn't wind up in jail. Why well, it's not much of a goal to shoot for, is it? But that's where a lot of Christian parents are, man. Just as long as Johnny's sort of normal and he learns to read and he can get a good job and he doesn't get into drugs and he doesn't get into jail. What about what the Lord had in mind? That our daughters would be like polished stones. You say, well, you're stretching that. Oh, have you not read? Let's read, let's read another one. Psalm 127. Psalm 127, you'll, you'll recognize the verses, verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, if that was written in 2023, it would, be, it would read like this. Low children are cute little things from the Lord. And the fruit of the womb could possibly be enjoyable at a much later date. As teddy bears are in the hand of a cute little girl, so are children of the youth. Did you notice, did you notice what the Lord compared, what he wanted those children to be like? Arrows. You know what arrows are for? You say they're for the museum. Oh, my soul, that's not what they were for. In that day and age, when a guy had arrows, they were going to kill something. An animal or they were going into warfare. The thought is that our children, we would see them as a precious heritage from the Lord. And that our hope and our goal, and I think this is your goal too. I, so I, I don't mean this as a rebuke. I, I say all this because I just know where the mindset is. Our goal and our hope is to raise children that will do damage in the devil's kingdom. That is our goal. It's way above not being a drug dealer and not winding up in jail. It's way higher than that. It's that God himself will go, look at this young person. I can use them in my warfare. That's what the Lord has in mind. Look in Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, and you'll see it again. Now, I, I say this. And I don't want to, you know, my goal, of course, with all this is not to be discouragement, you know, and everything doesn't always turn out perfect. And, and I, I get all that. And you know what? God's at work. And, um, and you know, people are, are people are always work in progress. And and I, I understand all that. I'm just saying as parents. This is our goal. This is what we're praying for. This is what we're working towards. And, you know, there may be some deviations along the way, but still this is our goal and this is what we're praying for. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. 
The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, now watch, hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. You know, that that's a, a polished shaft. And of course, the quiver there again, it's a reference to an arrow. It is a polished shaft. It is an arrow, a polished shaft. You know, when they made their arrows, their arrows had to be straight. And their arrows were handmade. You know, back in that day, they had some engines of war, but they weren't anything like ours and their bows and their arrows, those things were handmade, and it was very tedious, and the arrow had to be straight. And they worked on that arrow till it was like a polished shaft, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. So are children of the youth. You know, a lot of Christian parents, and, and there again, I, I just want to draw your attention this way so that we can get our focus because the world has us so messed up and the world's God is so deprioritized that, you know, um, it's, it's just, you know, th things aren't going well. And Christianity is collapsing internally. And, and uh, you know, we blame it on a lot of other things, but that collapse primarily begins in the home. The rot is internal. I mentioned this before. One of my boys was at a Christian college for a little while, uh, a number of years ago. And um, this would have been about 2004, 2005. Big school, still in operation. Um, and, um, you know, got a few thousand kids there. And they, they would they would consider themselves to be one of the fortresses of Bible-believing Christianity. And um, I think some of their staff are good people. I think some of their guys are on the right track. In fact, I know of two schools, and, and the same story was told about both of them. And I asked my son, who was actually in trouble at that time, with the dean or whoever, and, um, and I said, uh, you know, and he was talking to the dean. Remember how I told you how, how the dean looked at him and said, are they hiding things? Are they hiding movies? And he said, oh, yeah, man. He said, they're hiding them everywhere. And the, the dean was flabbergasted, or the, the dean of men was flabbergasted because he just thought, you know, if they're hiding things, it's got to be easy to find. But he said, oh, man. He said, no, they're hiding everywhere. So I told you that story. So I, I asked him, I said, uh, I said, in your time there, in your in your first year class, uh, one place there was uh, several hundred first year students. The other place was quite a bit smaller. I said, uh, did you meet any really really sold out godly guys? And he said, no. Now you say, well, that's just your son, okay? So we had another family from our church in PA, and they were at um, Pensacola, and um, they were living in the dorm. In Pensacola Christian College, big school. And I realized some people go there for law or whatever. And um, I, I was talking to him and talking to the dad. And I said, what's, what's it like there? Um, he said, well, the church services are dead as a hammer. He said, they are dead. He said, the only time there's any life there is Founders Week. He said, Founders Week, they bring Johnny Pope in. They bring a few good guys in. And he said, believe it or not, a bunch of the student body, a bunch of the first-year students get saved during that week. He said, because nothing happens the rest of the year. He said, the school body is so corrupt. He said that we just hang out in our dorm rooms and we just stay there. My point is this. People would say, oh, you know, you know, Christianity is having so many problems and, and they point, and I do too, I'm always nailing these online guys because God's people are sheep and they tend to gravitate towards the wrong things and that's just the way people are. But the real rot, why have we come to the place we are? And the problem for many 
was that in their home, vital, living, Bible Christianity was not the heartbeat of that home. Their goal was, Johnny, just don't embarrass me. Johnny, don't get into drugs. Don't get some girl pregnant. And don't go to jail. And just try to stay in church. And we'll be happy with that. That's our problem. We're happy way down here when our goal should have been a polished shaft in the hand of the Lord. So I'm going to stop there tonight. Just want you to think about that. And um, make sure your conclusions are Bible conclusions. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your book. Lord, help our children. Some of them are grown. And Lord, some of them, some of our children in this church, some of them, Lord, they're doing well. and Some aren't doing so well. And Lord, they're our children and we love them. And Lord, we pray that you will do your work in their hearts yet, Lord. And God, may, may that still remain the priority of our soul. And God, for those who have children in here now and those who will have children, God, may their desire for their children be Bible desires. God, keep us from drawing false conclusions, Lord. Help us, Lord. That whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, your glory would be the thing that we are concerned about more than anything else. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Lord, I do pray that in the midst of all these messages, Lord, you wouldn't let the devil sow confusion or false guilt or any of that sort of thing. Lord, in Jesus' name, help us, Lord, that the conclusions that are drawn and Lord, that and Lord, may people be inspired, Lord, to to just see things differently and to just go to you and to keep their priorities right. God, help us help the young people in this room. Lord, thank you for them, Lord. We've got a group of young people that they're good and their spirit is good. And, and Lord, they love you. God, help them to purpose never to lose that. And God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.